like that. The first maneuver. Then I'm gonna take a piece of paper, a piece of paper, a, 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 a piece of chalk, just so that I know where I need to push. I'm gonna mark a, a, a circle there. And I imagine that that was made of some kind of clay or silly putty or something that is very, very ductile. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start pushing in this part of the donut to create a little a pocket. Right? I'm not going to be breaking it or anything. I'm just going to be infolding it. Right? So I start infolding this and what I'm going to get is a little pocket that I'm making with the same material that was outside. I'm merely making a pocket like this pocket. But that is what's going to become the part of the container that, that holds the coffee. So now I'm creating an inner pocket by folding it inside. Now it's starting already to look like the mug. Now all I'm going to need to right now is straighten this by again pushing and creating some little, some little pinches here. And if I keep working on it, it starts becoming more and more like the coffee mug. Which means that in topology the two objects are identical. Now this has consequences for this for the way those spaces can be used philosophically. Because it means that only the most of oh, okay, let me just actually say one more thing. What remains exactly the same in, in, in throughout this operation is the connectivity of the space. If this point, point A, was on, there was a path that Ant, say, could follow to get from point A to point B, the same point A and point B needs to be still connected when I ended up all my folding and stretching. So the only two operations that are forbidden in topology are cutting and gluing. Because if you cut, you separate two points that could be connected before, right? Any cut that I made here, now these two points are not connected anymore. And if I glue, now I connect two points that were disconnected before. So topology is the, the branch of geometry that studies the the most spaces that, that can be in continuous variation, they can be continually changing from donut to mug to something else, as long as we don't introduce any cuts and as long as we don't introduce any gluing. This, of course, means that in the 21st century, somebody might invent a, a geometry that's even more powerful than topology, in which all that matters are things that remain invariant after all of this folding and, 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 and bending and uh, stretching in, and in addition, in addition, cutting and gluing. But nobody has invented it yet. So this is the most abstract geometry that we have so far. So because what Deleuze wants is a way of conceding what those immanent patterns of becoming are in reality, not in mathematics, in reality. He wants to conceive of that dimension of the world that is imminent to this world, not some transcendent heaven or hell, but a, a, dim, a, 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 a space like heaven and hell, that is a spiritual space, but a space that is not transcendent. So it's, a, it's an imminent spirituality, not a transcendent spirituality. So he immediately saw that what Poincaré, Poincaré had invented was exactly what he needed. This space that we live in today is mostly metric. They are mostly rigid objects. The rigid objects stay the same on the rotations, translations, mirror imagings, but they cannot be constantly stretched and bent into each other. We live mostly in a Euclidean space. And so this other space, the space where the immanent patterns are becoming are, the space where they live, so to speak, the space populated by patterns of becoming, cannot be a metric space, because this is, the actual space is metric. What he calls a virtual space, 
the space of pure possibilities, the space where all those tendencies that are unrealized right now, and all those capacities that are unexercised exist, the space of pure potentiality, of, of pure virtuality, cannot be a metric space. And so when he began studying, and he discovered the writings of Poincaré, he realized, this is exactly what I need. It's a space that's not metric, but a space that could become metric in a way that I want to show you later on. Now, Henri Poincaré did not leave, when he died, died in the early 20th century, he did not leave many disciples, and most of the disciples he, leave, he left were uh, French-speaking mathematicians who did not publish in English and whose books were not translated into English. Which means that the Anglo-American world didn't read, unless you spoke French, you didn't really get to read about one career. Mathematicians, of course, did, because, first of all, the books of mathematics are very little text, so it must be formulas and so on, it's an international language, and they would teach themselves French in order to be able to read the work of Poincaré. But philosophers, say the philosophers in England, or philosophers in, in, in the United States, who do not speak French, who did not have access to the works of Poincaré. He left only French-speaking disciples. So, in the early 1960s, when the ideas of Poincaré finally began reaching the general public, Paris was, was buzzing with Poincarean ideas. You know, you know, even someone like Jacques Lacan began to utilize ideas about topology to think about the space of the unconscious. For instance, you, know, you can ask yourself, well, if the space of, of, if the, if the space of waking life, or of the, uh, the life that you're awake, is metric, can we try to think of what kind of space is the space of dreams? And the space of dreams has a very weird reality. You know, you open one door that normally left, get, you know, you came in through that door from another room, you open that door, now you are outside in the mountains, so there's a beach outside, and it's, everything is like totally crazily connected, and, and it doesn't really have the kind of endurance and solidity and rigidity of this space. So it became perfectly possible for psychoanalysts, who of course were analyzing the nature of dreams, to try to think of, you know, well, what if, if, the, if the space of if the life awake is metric, can we conceive of the space of dreams as topological? And those ideas began making the rounds. Lacan was, Jacques Lacan, the famous uh, 60s uh, psychoanalyst, began applying ideas on topology. Then there were disciples of Poincaré, in the 1960s, such as René Tom, I'm going to add him to our list here. who began continuing Poincaré's work. René Tom invented a branch of mathematics called catastrophe theory. It's not necessarily about catastrophes, you know, like about car crashes or, or, or terrorist acts or anything like that. It is more about sudden discontinuities, about events that happen suddenly, like the events that we're looking, we were looking at when we talked about intensive thinking, to freeze or to boil, which happen at a specific point of intensity and suddenly water changes into one something else, into, into ice or into steam. And René Tom wanted to capture those transitions, those critical points of transition in a way that was mathematically tractable and invented catastrophe theory, an extension of René, of Henri Poincaré's uh, 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 mathematics. But again, he wasn't translated into English. You know, we heard something in the 70s, I remember when I was a student there, oh, have you heard about catastrophe theory and this and that? Chaos theory, which is, one, is the one that became much better known towards the end of the 80s, is sort of like the grandchild, or at least the, the offspring of catastrophe theory. By the time of the air, late 80s, chaos theory now became entirely popular. Even the guy in Jurassic Park, Jeff Goldblum, you know, it's like trying to come on to the archaeologists, you don't know if you remember when he, oh, you don't know about the butterfly effect, huh, babe? Well, you know, a tiny little difference in a butterfly, oh, yeah. And, you know, when, when Jeff...